April 14th, 1865, Washington, D.C. Abraham Lincoln wakes up that morning in a great mood. For the last five days, our capital was an absolute celebration. They'd been celebrating the collapse of the Army of Northern Virginia. You see, five days before, at Appomattox Courthouse, their commanding officer, General Lee, had surrendered to none other than Ulysses S. Grant, who was now very famous all across the nation. In the North, famous for good. In the South, he was despised and hated. He was called the Butcher. But in any case, Lincoln's in a great mood. That day, U.S. Grant would be in the Capitol. He was there to brief Washington on what had happened in Appomattox. At the same time, Lincoln was also happy because his son had also been there at Appomattox and was now returning home and was going to tell his dad everything he had seen. So the president was in an uncommonly good mood. He was also happy because the war is almost over. He can see its end. There's really not much else that needs to happen. It's all but done. So Lincoln decides it's a perfect time to take his wife, Mary Todd, out on a date. You see, they've been estranged for, well, several years at this point. They hadn't seen each other much. They hadn't talked much. Mary Todd would often get in unconsolable bouts. She was very sad. Often she witnessed the death of two children. And now the war was over. So the president writes a letter to his wife, asking her on a date that evening. He asked her if she would accompany him to Ford's Theater, where they would be watching a comedy called Our American Cousins. He also sent a letter to U.S. Grant and his wife, asking them if they would join. He was unsure of the answer, but he thought they would go, so he sent a third letter off to Ford's Theater, informing them that the four of them would be showing up at the theater that night. He wanted to give them a little bit of time to be ready. Now, unfortunately for the Lincolns, uh, U.S. Grant actually declined the invitation to go to the theater with them. He said that he wasn't feeling well and had urgent business to attend to. The truth was, the wife of U.S. Grant actually just could not stand Mary Todd Lincoln. And she said, absolutely not. I'm not going. Uh, you're crazy if you think I'm going to go hang out with that lady. A lot of people around D.C. didn't like her. Maybe fair, maybe unfair, but they really didn't like her. So in any case... The Lincolns, they send up several letters uh, asking other people to join them, and everybody declines. Finally, they get a young couple that say, yes, we would love to go. The couple is ecstatic. Of course, they had no idea that um, they were like fifth on the list to go. Um, but the couple's name was Major Rathbone and his fiance Clara Harris. So they decide, yep, the four of us are going to go to Ford's Theater. The Lincolns will pick them up at 8 o'clock that night. Evening comes. The Lincolns get in their carriage and they head off. They're already running late, but Lincoln is in such a great mood, it doesn't matter. He tells his driver that he doesn't want to go straight away to pick up the Rathbones. Instead, they take a long drive in their carriage around D.C. And it's at this point that uh, he begins to talk about the future, something he never did. See, Lincoln, Lincoln believed wholeheartedly he was going to die before the presidency ended, so he never spoke of the future. But at this point, he begins to talk to his wife all about what's going to happen next. She hadn't seen him like this in many, many years. He talks about how he wants to start law again, how maybe they'll move to California, how he's always willing to see it. And this is something she had not seen out of him in years. Eventually, they pick up uh, Rathbone and his fiance Clara Harris. Um, they're about 20 minutes late. The show had already started. The four of them, they get into the carriage and they head off to Ford's Theater. And they're in great moods, talking and enjoying themselves. They show up to Ford's Theater. They unload out of the carriage and they walk in. The show stops when the president comes in. People get up and they start applauding for the president. You see, he is... He's beloved at this point in D.C. by most people. Uh, he heroically is ending this war. You know, I mean, D.C. had been in celebration now for five days. They've been celebrating uh, the surrender at Appomattox. So everybody's applauding. Uh, the band strikes up, hail to the chief. He bows several times, and then they make their way up to the presidential box, which has now been decorated with the portrait of George Washington, as well as a whole bunch of presidential flags, and the American flag also draped across um, this box. The four walk in, sit down, and they take their seats for what they believe is going to be a phenomenal night of a great comedy. They are completely unaware that the night is going to take a tragic turn. Around the same time Lincoln was getting the news that Grant would not be joining him to the play that evening, a young, very, very famous actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth was arriving at Ford's Theater. He wasn't acting that night. He wasn't in the play, but he was there to get his mail. You see, he was such a famous actor that um, he would actually get his mail right there at Ford's Theater. So he's sitting, uh, reading his mail, sitting on the steps, uh, 
when one of the managers of Ford's theater approaches him and says, have you heard the news? The president and U.S. Grant will be here tonight together to watch the play. Isn't it so exciting? Booth said nothing, but immediately a clock in his head began to go. What did he have to do? How many things had to get done before 10 o'clock that night when he could assassinate the president? He had several hours, but a lot needed to get done. Okay, so we have to talk a little bit about Booth. Who is John Wilkes Booth? Okay, so Booth, he is a very, very wealthy, good-looking, well-dressed actor. He came from a famous acting family. His father was a famous actor. His brother a famous actor. So Booth is as famous as you could get for back then. He couldn't really go somewhere without people knowing him. Um, he lived his life in hotels, off room service. But the thing about him, other than being a famous actor, is... He was one, a white supremacist. Two, believed wholeheartedly in the Confederacy, hated the Union, and above all, he hated Abraham Lincoln. Hated him with a fiery, fiery passion. Often talked of killing him. Often talked of not just killing him, but possibly kidnapping him. In fact, he'd had a plot a little while prior to this where he attempted and wanted to actually kidnap the president, smuggle him down to Richmond, and then give him back in exchange for the Confederacy to just be left alone to be the Confederacy. So Booth has got this word that Grant and Lincoln are both going to be at the theater that night. And immediately he says, I'm going to assassinate these people. I'm going to kill them both. We're going to destroy the Union. But he wants to do more than that. He doesn't want to just kill Lincoln and Grant. He sees this as an opportunity to destroy the Union government. So he begins to round up all his co-conspirators. Now, co-conspirators is... It's true, but they were more like his entourage. This is a group of guys that were ordinary people that he let them kind of bask in his fame and glory because remember, he's a rich, famous actor. So he allows these people to kind of hang out with him. He gives them wine and he takes them to fancy dinners and they kind of get to enjoy the fame of Booth. So they all look up to him as this glorious, famous actor. So he rounds up all his co-conspirators. He brings them together and he says, all right, here's what's happening. We are going to kill Lincoln and Grant. That's my job. As Booth, I'm going to take out this. That is mine. I want that ultimate trophy. I'm going to kill Lincoln and I'm going to kill Grant. But I have jobs for all of you as well. Now he's got several people there. His first assignment he gives to a man named George Azeroth. George Azeroth, um, he also hates the, hates the Union. More than anything, he just really looks up to um, Booth. And George Azeroth has the easiest job. His job is to assassinate the vice president. Now, that doesn't sound easy, but here's why it's simple. You see, vice presidents back then, they did not have a home in D.C. So the vice president, Andrew Johnson, he's staying in a hotel. And it just so happens that Azeroth is staying in the exact same hotel, one floor above Andrew Johnson. They give him a gun. They give him a knife. It's simple. All he has to do is at 10 o'clock that night, he has to walk down to Andrew Johnson's door, knock on the door. Johnson answers. He pulls out his gun. Boom. Shoots him. It's done. It's a really simple assassination. There's nobody guarding the vice president. Why would you guard the vice president? So that's George Azroth's job. The next job is for a man named Lewis Powell and his partner, David Harrell. Now, Lewis Powell was about the best thing that the Confederacy could offer in terms of, you know, soldierly men. Uh, Lewis Powell was was big, he was handsome, he was tough, he was a great fighter. He fought at Gettysburg, he was captured, he was released, and now he kind of falls in this circle with um, with Booth, and he idolizes Booth. He actually calls him Captain. Idolizes Booth. So his job, Lewis Powell, along with David Harold, but Harold's more like his guide, uh, Lewis Powell's job is to go to the Secretary of State, William Seward's house, that night, enter the home, go into his room, and kill him in his house. Now, that's a difficult job. Now, why Secretary of State? Well, mainly it's because um, they knew he'd be home. The Secretary of State had a few days before gotten into a brutal carriage accident, and he almost died. It broke his uh, jaw in a couple places. He broke his arm. He broke some ribs. He was really hurt, and he was bedridden. So they knew that the Secretary of State would be home. All Lewis Powell has to do is get into the house, find his bedroom, and kill him. That's not as easy as it sounds, but that's their plan. Now, Booth, of course, as I said, he saved the best for himself. He wanted Grant and he wanted Lincoln. That was his prize. Unfortunately for Booth, earlier that day, while he was standing talking on the street, 
The person he was talking to saw the Grants drive by in a carriage. And he said, hey, there goes U.S. Grant to the train station. Booth was freaked out. He got on his horse. He took off after him. He wanted to make sure. And he follows this carriage and he runs right by him on his horse and he glares right at the Grants. He sees him and he's very upset. He whips his horse around and he rides back just staring at the Grants. Now, um, Ulysses Grant's wife, she actually talks about this later on, how terrifying this man was that just rode by and just glared at her. It turns out that it was Booth. So Booth knows that he is not going to get to take out Grant, but he can still take out Abraham Lincoln. So everybody has their jobs. The clock is set. All the executions have to happen at 10 o'clock that night. Now it has to get done.